talking here since we're starting a little late. So um, my name is Matul Kapadia. I am a pediatrician and, a, and direct the pediatric rehab program here at Mission Bay. Um, and I have done quite a bit of global health work. Um, this is a little bit of a different slant in the talk. So I wanted to talk about a little bit about ethics um, in the context of global health. Um, and I've been giving this talk for quite some time. And I think this is now my third time doing it um, through this pandemic. And I think it's been an interesting um, flip upside down about how we think about a lot of these issues in the context of um, COVID-19. And so I think um, hopefully we'll have some interesting discussion um, regarding that. So I'm gonna talk a little bit just generally kind of the principles that, and that we talk about when we talk about global, um, ethics. So human rights, ethics, law, kind of how they work together. Um, we'll talk a little bit about specifically how that relates to medical ethics. And I think the interesting part of this discussion really comes on when we talk about this and kind of more practical um, examples. So we'll go through some cases that I like to review that I think bring up a lot of these concepts and, and it kind of a more of a real world. And this is really going to be one that I want to open up the discussion and hear from you guys. Um, and we'll talk more about that. And then I, I've added par parts um, related to the pandemic because I think that in many ways, um, some of these abstract concepts have really become to the forefront when we're thinking about um, what we've gone through since 2020 in regards to um, the pandemic and how that's changed over time. So yeah, COVID-19, the elephant in the room a little bit. I think a lot about these concepts about distribution of care, about, um, about uh, investigations and studies when we were looking for vaccines and therapeutics um, and, and these concept of between human rights and what's right and what's wrong and distribution of care from, from well-resourced countries and less resourced countries and things like that, I think have really come, um, this has really brought a lot of those issues um, to the forefront in terms of how we think about global health um, through this pandemic that really has, um, no boundaries, so to speak. So I'm just going to start off with some definitions. Um, and I think you guys um, might be pretty familiar with these. So how do we define human rights? So human rights are, um, are basic rights that each human being needs in order to live a healthy and meaningful life. These include the best attainable standard of health, um, life, liberty, and security of the person, um, to marry and find a family, to be free from cruel, inhumane, or degrading treatment not to be subject to medical experimentation without free consent, and to be free from discrimination. Ethics a little bit get a little bit more murky in terms of how we define it, right? So now we're trying to tell people what is right and what is wrong. And those are um, subjective, right? Well, how people interpret what is right and wrong can change based on the person that's making those decisions, and then guide them in that behavior. So medical ethics is the methodology for considering the implications of interventions, right? Medical technology, treatment, and what ought to be. So what we think is right and what we think is wrong for a particular patient. And obviously, the lens for that um, depends on the person that's making those determinations. And then there's law. So the law is the structures, processes, and enforceable rules to regulate the relationship between and among individuals, communities, organizations, corporations, and the government. And they can impose sanctions or provide recourse if violated. Law is also can be can be changed, right? So, um, and we've seen that recently with our with our um, regime changes in, in, the, in the White House, right? So, how we um, can, can can make things what what's considered legal and illegal can change, um, and there the context for those in terms of a medical an ethics lens of what is right and wrong can also change depending on the person making those determinations or, or whoever's in power to determine those laws. So there's overlap between these, right? What we consider to be um, supporting human rights, what we consider to be right or wrong, and what we consider to be legal and illegal have overlap, but they are also evolving pictures. And we've seen this in particularly through this pandemic when we talk a little bit about how some of those domains have changed, particularly with the rapid um, change in, in the evidence and, and, and the medical um, guidance, for, for, for example, for controlling the pandemic. I put this slide and I added this when I was kind of going through this talk, um, uh, reviewing it this week. I, I had my first experience with the Human Rights Clinic um, this past weekend. And I don't know how, how many people are familiar with the Human Rights Clinic or not, but it's a clinic um, that's based in Children's Oakland. Um, it's a student-run clinic um, that offers, medical student-run clinic that offers forensic medical evaluations to help asylum seekers um, that are escaping extreme violence and persecution. Um, and in the first two years since the clinic started, um, they've done, they did over 150 evaluations, 100% of those um, evaluations did result in asylum grantees. And then they also provide a lot of social follow up. The reason I think this was interesting, because I think my, I, I did a shadowing experience, kind of my first um, experience this past Saturday. And I think that 
the Human Rights Clinic was a very really good example of, of all three of these concepts, right? You had individuals that had their, their, their claim is that their human rights were being sacrificed or being um, at risk from their home country, whether it's from persecution, from violence, whatever it might be. Um, and then there's this interpretation of asylum law, and that's changed. Um, we saw rapid changes of the interpretation when Trump was our, our president in terms of a, a significant backlog. These cases were not being reviewed because they were not being upheld. And then that's changed again more recently. And then the job of the medical evaluator, um, I think, is a really interesting one as well, because you are in some ways trying to interpret what's right and wrong for this individual. Um, but you're trying to do this with a very non-objective. A uh, very objective lens. So you are trying to objectively do a physical exam, get a history, and try to correlate whether this individual is story is consistent with your findings in terms of um, the risk for them potentially going back to their home country or being deported. And so I think there's this very interesting overlay between these concepts of what that I just talked about in terms of ethics, human rights, and 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 legality, and this kind of real world application in this clinic that's being run at UCSF. So it's a great it's a great clinic. Um, I just had my intro Production, but something that I would uh, that would certainly encourage people to get um, learn more about it and get involved if they're able to. But I thought this was an interesting um, kind of real world application. So what do ethics and law in the medical field address? Um, these are concepts I think that most people are gonna be familiar with. We learned these in medical school pretty early on, right? Informed consent for medical procedures and clinical research. Um, and we'll talk more specifically about what that means. Access to medical care obviously um, has a lot of um, legal implications, political um, implications as well. Confidentiality of medical records and data. Um, and that's a lot of it's guided by our HIPAA regulations and the relationship and particularly the confidentiality um, between a doctor and patients. First thing I learned in medical school when I was a first year, the guiding principles of, of medicine, right? Beneficence, a duty to act in the best interest of the patient and the health of society with compassion and respect for human dignity and non-maleficence, right? A duty not to harm the patient. These seem to be our overarching um, goals and are supposed to be kind of our guiding principles, when, particularly when we're talking about um, very specific cases. Uh, and we'll talk some, we'll give some examples of that later on. What are the requirements for informed consent? So first is competency, right? The patient must be capable of giving voluntary consent. And when they're not able to do that, for example, in our pediatric population, it must be obtained from a third party on their behalf, typically the parents. Um, and they need to have complete information. Patients must be given full knowledge of the name of the medical procedure or treatment, the positive alternatives to that procedure or treatment, and the risks, benefits, and uncertainties related to that procedure or treatment. And this certainly goes through for our, our research, our clinical research endeavors. And I think that when we're doing a lot of our global health clinical research, I think the relevance of this becomes um, magnified in terms of making sure that we are providing complete information to our potential research um, collaborators or subjects. And then I like this concept of assent. So although children may not be legally competent to consent for themselves, their wishes should, when possible, be taken into consideration. And this is what we call obtaining assent from a, a child. And this is a picture I had spent some time with during my residency in Botswana um, through, at that time, what was called the Baylor Indian International Pediatrics um, AIDS Initiative, BIPA. Um, and one of the things that we spent a lot of time doing in this clinic, which was an HIV AIDS um, focused clinic, was in addition to our routine kind of medical care, um, they had these kind of cartoon handouts or ca cartoon books that we would go through every single visit with the patient, um, kind of identifying the bad guys, right? The, the virus, whether it's HIV AIDS, uh, tuberculosis, and then the good guys, the antiretrovirals. And the idea here is really to get kids understanding why they're being asked to take these pills that make them sick or make them feel bad. Um, why they're getting blood tests done routinely, um, and to make sure that they're part of that assent consent um, part rather than just being um, a subject for that for those treatments. So I think it was great, and it was an important part of of really um, improving adherence to our medical um, recommendations. Confidentiality and disclosure. So what is confidentiality? Um, it means a medical practitioner shall not disclose any medical information without the consent of the patient. Um, there may be situations in which the medical practitioner may be forced to disclose such information due to legal requirements or to protect other individuals. So if an individual, for example, is threatening to hurt someone else or hurt themselves, or there's an infection risk that needs to be um, reported to the Department of Public Health, those types of things are times when we sometimes have to breach that um, doctrine of confidentiality. How is this relevant in global health? 
um, well, well, let me go through this slide one time. So what's the, why, why is confidentiality important? It allows patients to trust their healthcare workers um, in regards to their most sensitive information. Um, pay, people are more likely to access healthcare services when they know that they're going to be able to um, be protected with that information. Um, and in global health, we know that as long as discrimination occurs and the law does not protect people, for example, with HIV, um, with such discrimination, then it's impor extra important that, that that confidentiality is prioritized and maintained. Um, and this, again, is an example of a, a picture I took from my, my work um, in Botswana um, with, the, with the Baylor International Pediatrics AIDS Initiative. And, and I give this example, um, a big part of the, the program in the clinic, in addition to providing these the, the clinical care at the clinic, was to do outreach. And so they had these social workers, medical providers going into these communities where there was such a high prevalence of, of HIV, AIDS, and tuberculosis and trying to identify um, barriers to adherence or barriers to seeking care, follow up, those types of things. When they started doing this initially, they had these vans um, that were labeled with, with VIPAI, the Baylor Pediatrics and AIDS Initiative, um, for, for identification, for security, those types of reasons. And what they learned in, pretty quickly was um, they were losing that confidentiality. They knew these villagers knew that when these vans came in, that, that there was someone in the, in, in the village with HIV. Um, and, and and there was a reluctance seen widespread about, about seeking care um, that, that was felt to be the kind of this breach of confidentiality. So they had to quickly go to unidentified bands and trying to maintain anonymity with, with these patients um, and trying to protect their, um, protect their confidentiality about, about that diagnosis. So kind of a real world application of how that may work in the global health setting. I'm going to shift gears and go through um, cases right now. I, I don't know if there's any questions. I always like to kind of start with this general um, principles of, of ethics um, in medical care and then and the, in the context of global health. And then I think the cases will really bring about a lot of these principles. But I want to stop here and see if anyone has any questions about what I've talked about so far. I'm the chat in the chat. Any questions? I'm going to wait a few more seconds. Okay. I'm going to jump to the cases, and, and these are really going to be guided by you guys. So I'm going to be asking questions, and I'm going to wait for someone to jump in, or otherwise, I'm going to pick someone <laughs> and ask the, for what, what their thoughts might be in regards to the specific um, situation that we're talking about. So the first case, um, and, and these are these are real world cases uh, um, that, that um, I have been in or my colleagues have been in, and that's the reason I put these in here. So case number one, you're working in a community in Botswana and are doing a home visit to follow up on a TB dot um, patient. When you get there, you find a child who looks very ill, who you think needs to go to the hospital. You speak with the mom and find out that she does not have the resources to get to the hospital. So my first question, and there's no right or wrong in these questions. These are meant to be um, a, a kind of source of conversation and discussion. Do you pay for the transportation yourself? And I would love a volunteer to answer that if they could. And otherwise I'll, I'll kind of ask. We have a quiet group. I am going to see, is Molly Childers there? Hey, I'm here. Sorry, there's a lot of background noise. Um, in all honesty, probably I have that bleeding heart mentality where I absolutely would be willing to pay for it. But knowing like how sustainable is that in the long term with every person that I see in this situation? It's a tough question. Yeah, and that leads to the, that. That's typically the response I get. And so I, I, I make it more tricky. So the next part of this, as you were discussing options for transportation for the family and potentially being able to pay for it, as, as Molly said, a neighbor shows up with a child that is HIV positive and in respiratory distress. Do you pay for their transportation now? I'm going to ask Ramona. If Ramona is there. Fritz? Yes, I'm here. Fritz, what do you think? I definitely would pay. You would pay for the next person as well? Yes, you have the money, I will do it. Okay. Yeah, and, and, and as Molly said, I mean, that's where this tricky, this part gets tricky. And this has happened. This was this is the example of a case that I was in when I was doing this visit. And, and um, it kind of leads to this question is, is what if you only have the finances to support one person or a few people? How do you decide, you know, this, there's a very slippery slope in, in this conversation, as you can tell. Um, how do you decide who deserves the support more? 
Fritz, I'm going to ask you again. Yes. What if you're not able to help both of them? Do you then have to make a decision about who, who you would support more? Mm -hmm. What would you do? I will evaluate to see which one is more critical. One is to have more. So I will choose the one with the worst case. You would make a subjective kind of decision about who yes. maybe is in, in, in more distress, right? And, and yeah. I think that's where this gets, kind of gets tricky about um, this question of would you would do you focus on the, on the on the kid in front of you or do you invest in a more systems oriented um, fund? Do you do you use your resources and your advocacy and your support towards building a system so that because obviously this could lead to a lot more people and I think we've even seen this through the pandemic, right? You can target individuals, but then we in some of these countries that were really um, re really impacted on this by whether it was Ebola or whether it was COVID nineteen or whatever it might be, it becomes more and more challenging on the field about what you would do when you have a, a child and it's hard. It's hard in the real world when you have someone in distress and you think you can help them, but um, there's there's you can quickly see how that can progress and, and how you think about this as an individual when you're there um, can be challenging. So I, I guess this question is, is should you be focusing your resources and finances and support into a more systems oriented fund rather than um, individuals that need help? Does anyone have thoughts on that? I have such a quiet group. Uh, I definitely I would have agree some... with that. Oh, yeah. sorry to interrupt. This is Molly again. I think that's something that certainly gets to the point that, you know, you help the ones that you can while you see them, but then you also realize that there's a bigger picture and a bigger source of resources, I suppose, for these people. So trying to figure out how then you can filter in and make them more accessible to them in the future when you're not there to be the, the guardian angel or whatnot. Has anyone had an experience like this? I don't know how many of how many of you folks have done global health work. Um, I think this is a pretty common example, um, particularly when you're doing field work. Um, I'm, I'd be curious if anyone's had an experience of someone wanting, you know, an individual needing help and and trying to make a decision about what's the right decision in 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 that case. I remember I had this lady coming in my in my home. It was uh, like uh, five in in the morning. She was pregnant and she was uh, she had was uh, in labor and she could not go to the hospital. I had to make the delivery in, in the car of my wife, but so she's an uh, OBGYN. We did it in the car because she could not afford them to go to the hospital. So it's not easy sometimes because we have to do it. Yeah, I remember one the under the another case. It was in 2010, after the earthquake in Haiti. People come home and they call us because the lady was at home, because all the hospitals was were um, down, and we had to make the delivery where she was. It's the kind of things you cannot cannot. You just have to act. We have facing some situations sometimes that we have to do something. But both were uh, good babies and mothers. Yeah, thank you for sharing, Fritz. I, I think that's that's a, a very good example. I, I I think all these things in the abstract are very easy to think about um, about and you know that investing in a more systems oriented, working with the government. When but, but when you're faced with a child or in this case a pregnant woman in crisis, um, which the more field work you do, the more this happens. This this happens, and then I think you're. It's, it's something that I think good to think about um, what you would do in those situations, because I think anyone that's doing this long enough, and I'm sure Sohil has, has his own experiences there as well, um, deal with this question about what do you do with, with someone that's in front of you that's sick that needs help, whether it's financial or transportation, but then there is this potential for other people at Slippery Slope, and what do you do in, the, in that kind of real-time situation? I'm going to make this a little bit harder. So, okay, now you offer the money, but the mom still says no. After you establish rapport, you find out that the mom has had a bad experience at the hospital. Another of her children had died there. She's also um, She was also blamed for getting there too late in that case. Um, she did not fully understand because she speaks an indigenous language not spoken by the doctors at the hospital. What now? Um, do you still try to convince her knowing that the child will die otherwise? So adding a little bit of context of cultural context um, and, and um, 
differences, fear of <laughs> institutions in this case. And so now, 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 how do you approach this particular um, family or mother? Anyone with thoughts? So this is, so, or, no, go ahead. No, go ahead. Go ahead, Sohil. Oh, yeah, uh, this is Sohil. I've, I mean, I've definitely had situations like this and, and they are incredibly, uh, they weigh heavy on the heart, right? Uh, because it's it's so challenging to find a, a right answer. Um, in this particular one that, that you are presenting now, um, I, you know, I didn't think I was the right messenger uh, to make that case that, uh, you know, your child is critically ill. This was a very jaundiced, uh, you know, three or four year old with a severe hepatomegaly, uh, in the hospital I was working at, we did not have any further, even diagnostic, uh, abilities to, to know what to do. Um, and the added nuance, I think in terms of the family's reluctance to be transferred despite compensation was that it was uh, the growing season. And so it would, you know, severely impact their ability to provide food on the table for their family if the mother needed to go with the child to the hospital. Um, and, uh, and I um, made the case to my Malawian colleagues, uh, who then facilitated that interaction with the family in the indigenous language with a, a far better cultural understanding than, than I was able to convey. Thank you. So, I mean, I think that's a that's a perfect example, um, real time application of how this works. And I think that, again, I think it's very easy to think black and white. You see someone sick. This is what they need for care. But there's always nuances here, particularly when you're working in the developing world, um, and and particularly when you're working with different cultures, different thoughts. And and we know um, there's a lot of reluctance for allopathic medicine. There's a lot of reluctance for hospital care, particularly in this example where someone had a bad pyrrhic experience. And so you're kind of black and white. This child needs help. Um, what that what what help means, or, or or what the needs of that child are going to be interpreted differently, right? That family may think of the hospital as a you know, thinking as a, the hospital is a place that does harm, right? And that's that's our prior experience. And so the challenges are there and how you do that, how you work with, as, as Soville said, working with your, your local providers, your, if you have access to them, um, becomes extra important. Anyone have any other experiences similar to this in terms of um, kind of cultural differences in terms of thoughts of, of hospital or medical care and how they've had, how they've approached it from their own work or experiences? No. Okay. <laughs> All right. I would, well, have, would like to add something. Sometimes you are the only one who can help. I take the another case after the earthquake, 2010. A mother called me because the the child was sick, very sick. But all the clinics, hospitals, so everywhere was closed. She was keep. She was calling me, calling me. I told her that I cannot. Uh, see the child because the clinic was closed the hospitals hospitals were um, closed and much of them uh, were like uh, destroyed and i realized that i have had to see this the this child and i i went in the street close to the clinic she came and i saw the the baby on my car and I make, made the ordinance for her, giving her uh, some advices. And everything went well, because I could see, even though I had no chance to go to a hospital, but I give her what she would, what she had to do. Sometimes it's, diff, it's different in the United States. It's so easy, but in other parts of the world, it's not so easy to find ambulance or hospital sometime, we have to do something. And with a little one thing we have, we can do great things. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Um, I'm going to jump to the, to the next case here. Um, <laughs> it is about Haiti. And actually, this is another, I, I had gone to Haiti um, shortly after the earthquake as well. And this is, a, a, again, a, a story from, from my own experiences, but I want to see what, what they would do. So you're working in a medical rotation in Haiti shortly after the earthquake, working in a makeshift clinic, uh, very relevant to what we just heard from Fritz. Um, the second day you're there, a group of quote unquote government workers enter the clinic and ask for a bribe to continue working there as you are a foreigner. What do you do? Sonny or Ted? <laughs> 
I'd like to hear from some different people. Um, I think this is very tricky. Um, I honestly don't know what's the right thing to do. Um, I think I have an argument for both options. Like, I guess it's okay to pay them so that you can continue to help people. But at the same time, you're like kind of enabling these government workers to um, not take advantage, but um, do this uh, to other um, folks who come to the country uh, for good uh, good deeds. Um, so I, I honest, I think, to be honest, I think for me, I would have just paid them um, so that I could continue to work there. But I know it's not the best decision that I will make. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and Sunny, these are not meant to be easy questions. <laughs> and there's not meant to be a clear right or wrong. I mean, this was, a, like I said, this was a situation I was in, I ended up doing the same thing you said with it, with it, a lot of reservations of where that would lead. Um, I think I saw Teresa raise her hand. Teresa, did you have any thoughts? Yeah, or thanks. I mean, I think that the, I would separate this, I guess, into two kind of questions. <laughs> in my head, there's the what's the right thing to do, like from an ethical moral standpoint. Um, but in a situation like this, especially when you're in a, another country outside of your kind of comfort zone, um, and also just to layer on, like as a small woman as well, I would also be worried about like a security concern and my own safety. So it's a, for me, it would be it would be those two things that I'm weighing simultaneously. So not to make, that actually makes it even more complicated. So I would, I in this situation, I think that the safety concern would probably win out and I would, uh, I would probably pay. And that leads probably, right? <laughs> so, so do you do it if you feel unsafe, as Teresa just said, right? If there's concerns about your security, which certainly I felt in this case, um, even as, not as a female, but as a male in Haiti, where there, where there, where there wasn't the security, um, particularly after the earthquake. Um, what if your research or clinical project hangs in the balance? What if you're, what if this is your dissertation work, you have a client and you need to get data or whatever it might be, um, and you have funds from that? Would that, would that change your lens in terms of paying for that, paying, paying off these quote unquote government workers? What do you think, Teresa? I'm gonna ask you again. And we're saying now there's no concern about safety. There's no concern, but there, yeah, there's not a security concern here, but 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 this is more, this is your UCSF dissertation as a master's student, and you need this data to complete it. Um, and you have funds. Does that change your lens for what you how you would how you would approach this? Yeah, I mean, I think I would um I I would try to explore it a little bit and also rely on the people around me who um uh, may not be guests and might be locals to help me navigate the situation if that's an option. So kind of putting, pushing back a little bit like, oh, can I see some identification? Can you, you know, where's the, where's the protocol, the, the thing, whatever it is, the piece of paper that says that I need to pay, I'm happy to do it. Um, if you can provide me with a signed stamped, you know, whatever it is saying that I need to pay this to be able to continue my work here. So I'd push back a, a little bit and see if that amount of, um, kind of asking for some kind of proof or evidence of regulatory oversight is enough to deter people. Um, so I would I would try to navigate around it without directly just saying no. Yeah, no, that's great. And the reason I, I, I think these are things that are good to think about um, and, and think about in advance, because particularly depending on where you're going, if you're going to a war-torn place, like if you're, or you're going to a, 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 in a crisis situation, these are things that happen um, and how you would think about this when you have a project or your security or risk, I think are important um, and, and, and things I didn't, I hadn't thought of until I was kind of in, in, the, in this exact situation. So I think research is, a, is an interesting, um, we, we do a lot of global health research obviously through um, GHS, GHS at UCSF. Um, and, and there's a lot of ethics and, and concerns I think coming about 
when we're doing this kind of work, right? So we know there's vast disparities in wealth between the sponsor and host countries. Um, there's limited resources in the host country. There's a history of exploitation in the past for where we've done a lot of this work and we've done a lot of um, medical research in the past in, in, in resource limited settings and, and who benefits from that. Um, consent, all those things become much more of a, an important topic when we're talking about um, research. So research questions and priorities, right? What are, what are, are your questions and priorities, um, priorities for your host country or are they gonna ultimately benefit the country where you're conducting this research? Um, are they gonna have access um, to interventions that you may potentially prove as being beneficial or not? Um, what are the inter interventions for the control group? Are they putting them at risk? Is, is there a reason that this is being done in, in, in a resource limited country or a developing country versus a developed country? Is there a risk for exploitation? Informed consent becomes particularly important, um, particularly when you're working in resource limited settings, when you're working in different languages, different cultural beliefs and things like that, because you can actually see some of those doubts about medicine, about hospital care, um, based on how these trials are conducted. IRB approval, not just in our country, but working with our host countries as well in terms of getting approval and going through those official avenues become extra important when we're doing um, global health research. I put this as an example because this is something I had been involved with um, that's still ongoing, the PTBI, which was a $100 million grant from the Benioffs and Gates Foundation, um, a global initiative to address the epidemic of premature birth, the leading cause of death for newborns, and the second leading cause of death for children under five. Um, the goal of this was to implement and disseminate interventions that will diminish the impact of preterm births worldwide. And the initial phase was really focused on Kenya, Rwanda, Uganda. Um, I think there were a lot of ethical things. And I think a lot of the work that was done to the PTBI started with that principle um, initially, right? So how do we prioritize the research mission in prenatal care? So if we're, if we're focusing on things such as access to respiratory interventions, bubble CPAP, do the, do the, do the places that we're working in have access to those post PTBI or post the initial intervention, right? Um, as a rehab doctor, one of my big concerns was the mortality morbidity question. So if we are saving a lot of premature babies from birth by providing those interventions, um, but now we're creating more um, HIE, more brain damage, more cerebral palsy patients in a country that may not have the resources and, and avenues for care that we have in the United States for supporting that population, what are we ultimately doing in terms of the burden that we're placing on that healthcare system and the ethic ramifications for that. Um, and, and so I think that was an important lens to have um, when you're thinking about this, because I think it's very easy to black and white think about, let's save as many babies as we can. Um, but the context for that is different in different parts of the world. And then also taking into cultural considerations, a lot of different places of the world, particularly in more indigenous populations have different thoughts in terms of preterm births and what that means. And, and so it's easy for us again, to think that it's, we want to keep alive all the babies, but there's different thoughts in terms of um, what that means or, 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 or whether or not they, they want to save those babies. There might be a, um, other principles in place. So I don't know if anyone has any thoughts or anyone's work with the PTBI, but I wanted to give you that kind of lens uh, in a macro level um, of a big intervention that has been done by our global health group, but really how some of these principles can come about, particularly when we're talking about um, research and interventions in countries um, and getting them on board with it. Does anyone have thoughts on the PTBI or had work or, ex or experiences there? I'll just note for our trainees, I believe Dillis Walker, um, who's an OBGYN, will be speaking to you as part of the GME pathway on global health, and she's had extensive uh, experience with the PTBI. Yeah, and Dillis was the person I worked a lot with initially when we were coming up with the initial initiatives of this, and I think that some of these principles were really important um, in terms of if we're creating resource missions, making sure that there was an avenue for those long-term inter interventions to be accessible. Um, depending on where we're working. And I think that morbidity question was a good one too. So hopefully she'll talk a little bit more about some of the, some of the, this was a while ago now, I think we're probably what, seven or eight years into it now. So um, a lot more downstream thoughts about it. Um, I don't think I have too much more time, but I am going to talk about COVID <laughs> um, briefly, that elephant in the room. And I think that um, the, the pandemic and, you know, and the, again, this is not a right or wrong, but in every way, I think we are, our lens for ethics and global health, how we think about um, a lot of these concepts have really been turned upside down real time um, in, in terms of what we think is right or wrong and what we do. So I, this is, I'm going to put some of my thoughts out there, but I really would hope this was be a, an avenue for us to discuss things more. So, right, resource allocation, particularly in the early stages. Right, it, we we hadn't seen this before. Hospitals had to decide real time who deserved a ventilator or who who would 
who deserved a PICU bed or an ICU bed um, and, and how to make those determinations. We had never had to make those um, determinations real time before. And this, to this degree, until we had this pandemic, right? Priority setting. How do we, who do we prioritize for vets? Who do we prioritize for interventions, um, vaccinations now, right? Or access to antivirals. Physical distancing and masks, which I don't think have as much, personally don't think has have much of an ethics, but obviously we've seen wide discrepancies in terms of people's interpretations of, of whether or not that's a human rights violation, whether or not um, they're protecting yourself or others and, and how we interpret those things. Public health surveillance, right? So contact tracing, the privacy concerns, those types of things. Um, I was really involved along with Soho on the school reopening and that became a very controversial subject in terms of, um, are we putting teachers at risk? What are the rights, what are the obligations for teachers or schools and reopening? And certainly in the Bay Area, we had a lot of delays um, with reopening through the pandemic. Healthcare workers' rights and obligations. Um, when we know we're putting ourselves at risk, and we saw this particularly in like the summer of 2020 in New York and in other parts of the world, where um, we knew healthcare workers were putting themselves at significant risk of getting getting COVID-19 for do, for doing this care. Conduct of clinical trials. We just talked about research, but how how the data how how we got data on 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 antivirals or on vaccinations, where it was done, where we getting consent, those types of things I think became very um, important. And then just discrepancies in, in access to things like vaccinations and and antivirals. I think um, in many ways a lot of these concepts. Um, became much more prominent and we and we think about it much more differently out in the in the context of this pandemic so you know in, in countries in the initial stages of, of of the pandemic you know the countries that were the, the hardest hit right italy china united kingdom spain new york initially in the united states right frontline medical workers were faced with the dilemma that we haven't had to face to this degree before um, which patients should be treated first when resources are stretched to the limit, right? So there's one way of thinking of this as saying that we should, we should be trying to help as many patients as possible, right? So in that case, you're going to look for um, patients that we think are going to largely benefit from that. Or do you focus your resources on the individuals, maybe elderly patients or immunocompromised patients that are the most likely to die um, from COVID-19 and, and use your resources for that, right? Not a right or wrong decision, but something that we abstractly have thought a lot about, but never have had to make such real-time decisions as we had to do um, in these last couple of years. So I, I would love to get people's thoughts on this, because I think um, as people are trainees and you're going through residency, and you you don't see that you this as much um, until this pandemic. And I think obviously in the Bay Area, we weren't as resource limited and we didn't get hit as hard as other parts of the country and certainly other parts of the world. Um, and in the global health context, obviously resources are even more limited. Access to ventilators are more limited. Access to ICU beds are more limited. And so these decisions um, for healthcare workers and healthcare systems became even more magnified in those settings. But um, I'd love to get people's kind of general thoughts of what their experiences have been or their thoughts about this in the context of, of the pandemic, if anyone has any, or I'll ask people. Uh, Ted or Matt, do you have any thoughts or, or anything that you can think of in regards to the pandemic with resource allocation? If you guys are there, Ted, Ted Cho or Matt Custer, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I feel like, so I, I'm an intern um, and during the depths of the COVID pandemic, I wasn't in a clinical setting because I was Kind of kicked out of the hospital and then i went into an mba program so i was uh, not in a clinical environment during kind of the heaviest toll um, so it's really hard for me to kind of contextualize the burden that the system it, i mean at least in the us was facing um, but from the things that i was reading in the news and what i was hearing from friends uh, at residency programs or medical schools across the country, uh, it seemed like, like uh, every uh, kind of patient encounter was its own battle because um, there just wasn't a lot of information or resources about what to do. And I think for me, it highlighted the difference between how you're supposed to think about patients from a provider perspective and from a public health perspective. And it's something that I thought about previous to this, but I, I thought it highlighted it pretty clearly, clearly for me, which is in the moment when you're kind of caring for that patient, 
that should be that patient should be your only focus. So it, you know, as a prof, in the provider role, it really shouldn't be your decision whether you're saving materials or resources for a patient down the line or some other patient somewhere else. Like it is as the provider, the it is your responsibility to do whatever you can for that patient in front of you versus thinking about it from a public health perspective. It's more of a, how can we minimize or kind of mitigate the toll that is being felt across the entire system. So I don't think that this is a single question for all audiences. I feel that it is a question that is answered differently in different uh, uh, settings for different audiences. Um, yeah, so that that's just my take on this particular point because it's you know it, it's really hard to answer both sides, right? Whether it's you know, save this particular patient or save all the patients, it's really more of a different. Uh, different clinical environments have different answers and things to think about. So. It's, it's not quite a fair question, I feel. Yeah, no, I, I think that's a great perspective, Ted. And I, I think that, you know, in the, in the global health arena, this this isn't a common subject, right? I mean, I, I, had done, I, I did a lot of work in, in, in a community, kind of in a rural India community. Um, and I had asked this question initially when I started working there where they didn't have ventilators, they didn't have CPAP machines. And, and, and I was wondering why, you know, when I saw patients that I certainly thought could benefit from this, and it was, it was a, as you said, a kind of a public health decision, they thought that the allocation of resources and finances to support that um, wouldn't be in the global benefit for their community. So uh, providing more care and trying to, for more patients was a, a bigger priority than, than the, the, the amount of resources they have to commit to helping them the sickest. We just hadn't seen this degree of decision making that happen was happening in the United States until COVID nineteen. I think it's is it really brought some of these questions and and I mean UCSF was making some of these decisions. We didn't fortunately ever get to the point of a kind of a crisis situation in terms of beds or ventilators, but certainly there was a lot of thoughts and preparation for this. Um, so Hill. Sure. Yeah. With regard to UCSF or. Um... Actually, maybe I'll pose this as a question if this if this works to the group. And uh, maybe Jason, I'll, I'll call on you. So let's say you are the chancellor of a very large university somewhere in California, and you hear of a pandemic coming, and you have uh, benefactors throughout the world that have access to large quantities of, of PPE. Um, do you subvert typical supply chains? and procure large amounts for your staff, your hospitals, your patients, or do you go through the, the regular channels? Uh, thanks, Ahil, for the, uh, the promotion. Um, I think uh, it's actually funny. Uh, at the start of the pandemic, um, I was part of a team that was helping Rhode Island Hospital um, find new uh, supply chains for PPE. Um, so I think, you know, again, probably not a very, um, uh, courageous response, but, uh, you know, probably my initial thought would be to draw a line down the middle and say, are there new, uh, new streams in which, you know, we could get PPE. I, I don't know. I don't know if I would truly try to disrupt what was currently being done. Uh, because I think when it comes to the global pandemic, for me, I was, I would think about, you know, some, uh, something being a problem elsewhere can eventually become your problem. And I think that uh, if you sort of deprive PPE from one part by, by taking it from one part to give to another, you might just be creating more problems for everyone down the line. So I think uh, my, my thought would be, initial thought would be to try to see if there are sort of new ways in which to get something like that. But that's just off the top of the head, off the top of my head. Yeah, and I'll, I think this will be, this will be a good lady right there kind of where, so I, like I said, I've given this talk a few times um, and every time it's been different because we've been in a different circumstance with, with the pandemic. So, you know, in August of 2020, um, scientists around the world were working quickly to develop 
vaccines. And there was this, the, the ethics concepts there were really about how we were designing those research questions, who was being used as kind of the guinea pig, so to speak, um, for those vaccines, if they were or not, um, minimizing risk on a, on a new vaccinations. Informed consent became really important um, at that stage, getting FDA approval, all that kind of stuff was important in those initial stages. Um, and then, as, as Sohil said, he was talking about PPE, but vaccines became a big part of this as well, right? Like, we have vaccine requirements um, as soon as they became available in many parts, including UCSF. Um, and, and, you know, right now, the, the news this morning was, was the FDA just approved the new bivariant booster for us. Um, and, and this is the, now the second booster, or for some people, their third booster of COVID. And, and, and at the same time, there's many parts of the world that still haven't had access to initial doses of the vaccine for much for large parts of their population. Um, the US, for example, brought enough vaccine doses initially to immunize everyone. Um, with a huge stockpile, including including boosters, right? And these are being bought from countries such as India, where they were being manufactured. Um, it's kind of a zero sum game. We're getting those vaccines to access those vaccines, which means other countries, particularly countries that don't have as much resources or finances to be able to get them, right? Um, and so what they have public health and infectious disease ramifications. We think a lot of the variants that we're seeing now, right, the Omicron variant, the BA5 variant, are coming about in places um, where there hasn't been a lot of um, vaccinations, where there is more access to immunocompromised folks to have um, the, the virus gets in more of an opportunity to, to um, morph um, and, and change. And so, you know, COVID-19, while we can think about it from the U.S. lens, this has been a very good example of how there are no borders for, for this virus in particular. And, and even though we have to make real-time decisions about things like PPE or, or vaccines, not just from the US, but as Sohil said, a hospital system or a, or, or a clinic has to make decisions about those types of things. So, you know, it, it, I think it's a really good example of, of, of public health in, in a different perspective. I think everyone's thinking about what you can do for your, your, your particular clinic or your own hospital or protecting your population by stockpiling things. But we know that this virus exists outside of things. And I think when we're talking about global health and ethics and some of these kind of abstract principles, this pandemic and what we've experienced over these last two and a half years has been a very um, informative in terms of how we think about those things. Uh, I'll, I'll, you know, I'm gonna kind of finish with some of these um, <laughs> silly slides. So. Is mask wearing, social distancing a human rights issue? I don't think so, but there's a lot of people that think that think that um, forcing people to wear masks, particularly in the early stages before we had vaccinations, was a violation of human rights. Or is it something that we're doing that's right to protect yourself and others, particularly immunocompromised? Right? Things that I don't think should be uh, have such a degree of ambiguity certainly did, and we see that in different populations of this country and kind of throughout the world. Um, there were doctors that saying that using masks was actually um, a risk of infection. So I put that in there because this the CDC had to actually put out guidelines saying there's no valid scientific evidence to support the assertion that the use of a face mask imposes a higher risk of infection, things like that. And then there's just the silly stuff, which I'm going to put in, right? All the um, the, the <laughs> unproven um, evidence, the, the hydroxychloroquine, the ivermectin, the horse pills, all those kind of things that were being backed by doctors, that were being backed by people in power, right? And creating more um, confusion um, for, for patients and, and for communities, more confusion about who to trust and what to trust. And all of that has added this other layer of doubt and, 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 and confusion um, and, and challenges, I think, as healthcare providers through this pandemic. So, you know, I put this all out there. There's not a right or wrong, but I think in many ways, COVID-19 and what we've experienced has really um, given us a different lens about thinking about um, ethics and thinking about um, infectious disease across boundaries. But I, I don't know if anyone has any other thoughts. That's kind of my last slide, I think, but I, I wanted to kind of leave it um, with the discussion about the pandemic and kind of what we think about how things have changed. I'd love to get people's thoughts. Who has not talked? Uh, Kim, if you're there. Hi. Uh, yeah, I would say the most morally difficult, ethically difficult parts of the pandemic for me were less the large questions. And I'm in pediatrics. And so the most difficult moments for me were when I had to tell a parent that they couldn't be with their sick child. Um, it's not why I got into this field. I found it really, really challenging. And um, there were a bunch of us, I'm actually in nursing, not in medicine, but like found ways to be subversive. Like, it's so weird. You get used to like sneaking things into a hospital, but I didn't ever think I'd have to like sneak a parent in or sneak a sibling in. 
And so for me, those were the most um, challenging moments. Does anyone have thoughts on this kind of more macro picture? Thank you, Kim, of, of like vaccination access. Um, and I think that this is something that's gonna be a continued issue, um, particularly when there's limited supply and like the supply and demand principles we usually think about um, don't work so well when we're talking about limited access and, and discrepancies in wealth between countries and communities. And I think this has shown it, uh, especially when we're talking about a virus that has the ability to morph, um, particularly in areas that don't have access. So I'd love to kind of get people's thoughts on this because I think this is, probably the global health question that we're facing right now um, through this pandemic. What do you think? Teresa was nodding. I'm curious what you think. You have, you have your video on so I can see you. Yeah, I mean, I'm nodding because we actually did a, a podcast club for the Global Health Pathway residents last year, specifically on this topic. It was probably like November timeframe. Um, so, you know, this is an ongoing shifting um, issue. And I think at that time we were talking about how there would be new variants. And so this was like pre Omicron, right? We were talking about how there were going to be new variants because we were under vaccinating, um, you know, large swaths of the world and that many vaccine doses had been promised, but not yet delivered. Um, and there wasn't the needed focus on that, like kind of last mile health, like how do you actually deliver vaccines into people's arms? And so it was kind of like, in retrospect, I think so, Hill, it was like amazing and tragic foreshadowing for the Omicron surges that were coming because it was sort of like seeing the train barreling towards the cliff edge um, and all of the kind of warnings from experts in terms of what could happen and what this could mean by neglecting huge areas of the world um, really came to pass, right? And here we are now, we have all these vaccines and I think I, and I was trying to find the article, but I think the U.S. Um, actually ended up um, throwing away a lot of our purchased um, Moderna and Pfizer vaccines because they're now irrelevant. And so not only did we like hoard it and take it from other populations, but we're now literally just throwing it away because in our inability to share it with other populations, it's now not very effective. So I, I just, I guess I, I think the sadness of it is that the pandemic brings out that all kind of pandemics on the scale kind of bring out the ugliness of human nature. And one of the recurring themes we had in this pathway is talking about how do you break down the other piece and like the us versus them. And I think this, the bummer is that, or I guess the real disappointing part of this is that walls just go up um, and people start to think about their country, their hospital, like it gets closer and closer, you know, your family in terms of um, that survival mechanism and when it's under threat. And instead to really get out of this, we have to take the more global holistic approach. So sorry, you might you might be regretting asking me what I think. I have a lot of feelings about the matter. No, that I mean, that was great. I, I, I you said it very eloquently. I think that in a lot of ways in our past experiences with, with virus or, or infected disease, whether it was Ebola or HIV, we were able to, in some ways in global in the global health world, think of it as an other type of virus, right? This is predominantly sub-Saharan Africa disease, or this is predominantly in whatever part of the world. And we're, we're getting some of it, but it's not. And then I think, yeah, this was an example of something that we hadn't seen to this, obviously, degree that was affecting us and them and everywhere um, and real time had to make decisions and and we saw that we saw as you said you know we had to every country kind of thinking for themselves um every ho hospital thinking for themselves every doctor or family having to think for themselves about what they want to do um and and it's hard to have that other lens as well um and, and we're seeing the ramifications and unfortunately i think this is going to be continued this is probably going to be the global health question for the for the forthcoming future in terms of things. So what do you, I, I'm sure you have lots of thoughts on this, but I'd love kind of. Yeah, <laughs> pl pl plenty of thoughts. Um, I think, uh, well, just to throw in a, another a communicable disease into the mix around vaccinations is in, in recent times, there's been a lot of uh, criticism around uh, the monkeypox vaccine, right? The Genius vaccine and the fact that um, the United States has had a stockpile of doses for years upon years upon years uh, when this condition has been endemic in other parts of the world without any access to any vaccine. And, uh, you know, if we rewind the clock, what a global citizen universal mentality could have meant to this point in time if distributions and allocations had been differently decades ago, if that makes sense. 
but with regard to, to COVID vaccine allocation, you know, we, we talked about this back in November, and uh, I haven't caught up as much on the literature since then. But uh, one of the frustrations to me then was even the, the notion of this being a scarce resource, uh, because that is a manufactured geopolitical um, status, more so than a true limitation in the amount of stuff you need to make it, right? Like uh, manufacturing and all those processes could very well have been scaled up far more exponentially, uh, far more rapidly. Um, were we to rethink how we think about trade laws and patent laws and manufacturing and supply? Um, and those were among uh, the then uh, most real constraints, I would say, um, and continue to this day. Yeah, and those are great thoughts. And I think this is, along with that, the, the fact that what's happening in other parts of the world is affecting the virus in our country, right? And I think that lens was hard for a lot, and it still is hard for people to think about, think about, because there's always been this other in us kind of mentality, but other parts that don't have access to vaccine create variants that will then effectively impact us. And, and, and I think things are evolving, but it, it's been a real time application of some of these concepts and real time change rapidly changing. So does anyone else from our trainees have thoughts on, on things? I know we're out of time or running out of time. Sure. Uh, yeah, I have something. Um, I would say in lieu of the more ideal of shifting our consciousness to being global citizens. I, I think in terms of like vaccine distribution, I have kind of a more of a utilitarian mindset in terms of what are the incentives of other people to make things work. Um, I guess something that I've been thinking about is, is something related is like, adoption of um, like renewable energy sources. And depending on say where you lie on the political spectrum, certain arguments are more persuasive than others. Whereas someone who's more left leaning would like to talk more about climate change and the future sustainability of energy use in the future. Maybe someone not on that end of the spectrum would be more convinced by energy independence as an argument or national security or something like that, which is in a utilitarian sense, getting to the same end goal of more solar panels, more turbines. So sometimes I think since like the consciousness piece is probably gonna be a slow moving thing in terms of like actual end goals, if something more utilitarian is more useful. It's a good analogy too, right? Because it's it's similar in the context of we can do, <laughs> we can we can do what we can do, but the pollution or the or, or that's happening in a, in a different country is having the same impact in terms of climate change, right? And so, it takes a lot larger lens when you're trying to tackle something like this, which I think a lot of groups are trying to do. So most of what I'm talking about doesn't have right or wrongs, right? And so I start off with this kind of general concepts of ethics, and I think that I tr hopefully we've had some you guys have had some ability to think about what, how this applies on the field or how this apply through the pandemic. And I think that a lot of our concepts of human rights, of ethics, of, of law have fluctuated, have changed. And I think that the rapid fire change of, of our therapeutics and our understanding of this pandemic have really given us that broader scale lens to think about things. So hopefully it was a good discussion. I don't wanna keep you guys longer than, I think you guys might have another talk, I'm not sure, but um, if anyone has any other thoughts, I'm happy to hear it, but I hopefully uh, it was a good discussion. Thank you for participating. Thank you for guiding us through this, Matul. Very much appreciate your time and uh, and exactly what you've just uh, recapped with, you know, introducing the concepts and having us struggle through them and think through uh, the challenges associated with some of these areas where there is no right or wrong answer. Um, in the chat, Tiffany's put in an evaluation for the session. We 